Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, episode of uh, Ready with an Answer. Uh, today will be part two of our discussion on Roman Catholicism. If you didn't see part one, it is on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I hope if, if you're interested, you can go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, in part one, basically, we established a couple of important things. So first, we asked the question, why is it important to even discuss Roman Catholicism? Shouldn't we just accept them as part of the church? And or or is do they have serious problems, serious errors that that, that tell us no, they're they're not really part of the church, and it, we need to address their errors? And we decided, yeah, their their errors are really serious, and they we actually concluded that they are a non-Christian cult, that in fact the largest uh, cult in the world. And then, and then we started talking about the origins of uh, Roman Catholicism, and that's where we're continuing today, still talking about the origins of Roman Catholicism. So, uh, okay, let me just introduce the panelists, and then we'll begin. Uh, I see Brother Bill just joined us. Uh, you got your audio working, Bill? Hello? Yeah, Bill, you got your audio working? Yeah, you can hear me, all right? Yeah, we can hear you. We're just starting, so I just want you to say hi to the audience and the panelists. Tell them about your channel, and then I'll we'll move on to Jason uh, and Sam. Okay, hello. My name is Bill, and I am the, the Panda Man Evangelist. Yes. Well, let me just say that... Uh, Bill is, uh, he's normally not a man of a few words. He, he usually uh, has a lot of uh, things, he expounds on things quite well, quite thoroughly. Maybe he's just being being humble. But uh, his YouTube channel is Pand Da Panda Man Evangelist. And I hope you'll subscribe to his channel. Uh, he, he does an excellent job uh, with his YouTube ministry. And he's also uh, one of the few street preachers in the world that is actually preaching the the true free grace gospel of salvation. So uh, I, I hope you'll subscribe to him. And we got brother Jason Werner. Uh, I'm going to ask you to say hi to everybody. We just did an interview with you last week about your, your book. So Jason, say hi to everybody. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Thank you, Luke. Good job. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you. And then next, next we have Brother Sam, uh, Thick Shades. Would you uh, say hi to everybody and tell everybody about your channel a little bit? Hey, guys. This is Thick Shades, um, and uh, my channel is youtube.com slash Thick Shades. Um, well, you know, I'm Thick Shades because, not because I'm wearing shades, but, um, you know, hopefully that some of you out there may kind of feel the breeze and coolness from that channel. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, I'm glad that we also, uh, in the midst of such serious topics, that we also have a good sense of humor. I know that uh, Sam, Sam and Bill have often interjected some humor, and so uh, Jason, uh, he doesn't usually interject humor, he just interjects joy and a big beautiful smile so that's that's wonderful too okay let's start uh, where we left off last time uh, discussing the origins of Romanism uh, the we were talking about how it really arose in uh, because uh, the Emperor Constantine decided to uh, bring uh, the Christian religion that had previously been persecuted by the emperors, he decided to embrace it and bring it and, and make it a, a, an acceptable religion of Rome. And then eventually they made it the official religion of Rome. Uh, but in the midst of, of, of bringing it in, uh, they, uh, they incorporated the pagan religions of Rome into the uh, Christian uh, so it, instead of having real pure Christianity as we had in the beginning of, uh, of the church, once Rome got its hands on it, 
it was totally ruined because of all the pagan religions that were blended in with it. We talked about the cult of Isis, uh, and then Mithraism, and now today I'm going to move to the next point, and that is, uh, 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 I'm just going to ask you guys to respond to these, these points as I read them here. It says, most Roman emperors and citizens were henotheists. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's, it's pronounced H-E-N-O, henotheist. A henotheist is one who believes in the existence of many gods, but focuses primarily on one particular god or considers one particular god supreme over the other gods. For example, the Roman god Jupiter was supreme over the Roman pantheon of gods. Roman sailors were often worshippers of Neptune, the god of the oceans, when the Catholic Church absorbed Roman paganism, it's, it simply replaced the pantheon of gods with the saints. Uh, let me stop right there and just ask everybody's reaction uh, to that. Uh, and let me go um, in first, I'll, I'll just go from my screen from uh, right to left. We'll start with Sam. Sam, uh, what are you, what's your response to that, that charge against them? Well, you know, I mean, for me, I, I, when I think of Roman Catholic, for example, and um, I always think of some kind of this church building, you know, with brick and mortars and priests and these dark scenes, heavy music, um, and these gowns, you know, a lot of flagellation, repentance. Um, but but what's what's bothering me on top of that is that uh, how people would be blindly following uh, like for example priests or even the Pope calling him the, the Holy Father and, and things uh, when Christ clearly said you know not to call anyone father nor uh, would anyone be holy uh, other than other than Christ and when people are still kind of ignorant of that sort of things. And it's kind of uh, frustrates me in, in many ways. Uh, but regarding what we're talking about, I think um, we really need to kind of focus on uh, actually the Word of God because I think most of the, these heretical problems, you know, recently I'm coming across with this universalism and this person is just flatly denying the most obvious uh, scriptures and a majority of scriptures and then just just blindly focus on one particular script, uh, passage where he even that he is misinterpreting and, and that sort of um, you know heretical teaching and this, that sort of blind belief I think that needs to be, um, you know, taken care in the body of Christ because that sort of things will only confuse a lot of people. You know, any sort of heresy, they are not there to edify the body, but all, but only to, you know, doubt our faith and only to just, you know, uh, lessen uh, the faith in the body of Christ. So. You know, I'm sorry, I'm just you know uh, just dragging this on and on, but uh, I, I am I am quite preoccupied with this uh, this um, this person named Andy, and I'm, I'm quite concerned about him because um, he's basically saying that um, cross crossless gospel. You know, basically he's saying that you don't need Christ to uh, to be saved. You know, it's almost like where Catholics are saying, "Okay, you gotta believe on Jesus Christ, but you know, but you gotta work, you know, so and so, so that you can be saved." And that when whenever I hear that sort of uh, heretical false doctrines, it's just really <laughs> says my heart. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on. Well, for those of you who do not know Sam, uh, he, he's he's very very busy and it is exhausting to 
spend your time uh, trying to correct these horrible heresies that we see so <laughs> on YouTube. So um, you know, you're preoccupied with that problem, and and the interesting thing is that uh, uh, universalism is what you're uh, talking about right now, and in Roman Catholicism, uh, I just heard the the current pope that so many people seem to love so much now, um, tickling everybody's ears and saying that um, uh, even atheists will uh, will go to heaven uh, if they do enough good things. Even atheists will go to heaven. So that's that is a kind of form of universalism too. Um, but let me move on to um, Brother Jason and ask him. Uh, the idea of henotheism, I never really heard the word before, but it, it's like polytheism, except they believe that there's many gods, but they choose to take, choose one particular god to be their pet god, or their, their, their favorite god, and then the other gods are likened in the Catholic Church, kind of like the saints, with the Roman Catholic see, you have God and then you have all the saints. Uh, Jason, have you ever heard of something like that? Well, it's similar with Hinduism too, you know. Uh, you know, you, we see similar issues with, like Jehovah's Witnesses. We got into that many months ago. It might have even been a full year ago. Um, the Mormons, they have some things that are really off the wall. But it all comes down to this, this one issue. It's grace. It's God doing this. One God. And I was just checking out, for example... Brother Sam's page, and um, the first video has got there right on his front page. It's you know the cross. It's 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 Christ, God first, and then what you what follows there is it, he has number two. He says it says literally number two, which is it's it's faith only because it's, it's it's grace, okay, and then after that. He's got on there, works follow. It just follows. Anytime we see people trying to, like you and I have said, Luke, we're trying to put God in debt by doing something, we're putting ourselves under this, this law. And obviously we know of it as the law of Moses, our own strength. Ultimately, by doing this, we're creating as Brother Sam said, confusion and creating a, a false sense of peace that will not last. And the encouragement I have for everybody is you have an inward witness. I have an inward witness. If you don't have peace about something, it's probably not God. The work of righteousness shall be peace, Isaiah 32, 17. The effect of righteousness, assurance, and confidence. What we're seeing in this explanation, as you have for us, Luke, with regard to Roman Catholicism, is fear. Do this, do that. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. And wow, and now you're talking about how atheists, or another pope, can get into heaven? Wow. But here's the thing. Where is Jesus? Where is the cross? That's just what this comes down to. And when you see the cross, you see grace. And when you see that, you see peace. You, you will have peace. So it all comes down to this. Confusion of the devil. Fear of the devil. Peace. Joy of God. You will have feelings, and these feelings that we have are real. Go ahead, Luke. All right. Uh, thank you. The, um, obviously, we're going to go into the Roman Catholicism doctrines, uh, you know, eventually in this study. Um, but it's true that it's it's a works-based system. Uh, but in, in a way, it's also universalism because they say that everybody can w will be saved if they just do some good works, and that there's no necessity. For Jesus Christ, according to the current Pope, as long as an atheist does some good works, then they too can go to heaven. So, but Bill, I, I'd like for you to respond to henotheism. Have you ever heard of that before? And what's your opinion of that uh, teaching? 
Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that henotheism, and even you know that the Roman Church itself, you know, from its conception, was henotheistic, and and it still is now. You know, if if you look at what they actually believe and and who they worship, you know, I I see they've got three gods even now. They've got God, i.e., the Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Then they've got Mary, who is co-redemptrix and Queen of the Universe. And of course, they've got self as God, because we know that that's a workspace salvation. So they're, they're making themselves God. They've exalted Mary to almost Godship, and obviously the the, the, the triunity they have as well. So nothing has changed. That they're still henotheistic. Wow, good one. I like that. Yeah, very very good point. So yeah, they are still henotheistic in that they have all of these different gods, they're gods to a certain degree, uh, and the, the, one, the one that they seem to be really uh, placing number one is, is, is not the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or, or our Savior Jesus Christ. No, that, that's not number one. Number one seems to be Mary. So they put Mary on this pedestal, and then you have all the others that, so it, yeah, it's, it's, I'd say that it's henotheistic, if I understand what that is correctly. I've never heard the term before, but, so, uh, yeah, they started off as henotheistic. I mean, and that's what, that's what pagan, is, pagan Rome was, and uh, the Roman church, even today, still has henotheism. Uh, let me move on and read up another point, and then get your reactions to this. So, it says, uh, uh, Okay, uh, just as the Roman pantheon of gods had a god of love, a god of peace, a god of war, a god of strength, a god of wisdom, etc., so the Catholic Church has a saint who is in charge over each of these and many other categories. Just as many Roman cities had a god specific to the city, so the Catholic Church provided patron saints for cities. <laughs> Okay, this time we'll go in the opposite order, and we'll start with Brother Bill. Can you respond to that, Bill? Yeah, well, that's that's true. You know, they have all these different patent saints, and you know, they they pray not only you know, they pray to these saints. So it's not a matter of you know, although you have within the 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 Eastern Orthodox Church, they have icons and they have all these saints and that lot. In the Roman Church, they they pray to them as if they you know they can intercede, you know, for them. So they they're clearly making multiple you know multiple godlike people out of the saints, you know. And, and even we know, for example, Michael they actually pray to, to to the archangel Michael. So yeah, that's you know that that ties in what we've just said earlier, and, you know, being henotheistic and, and also having these multiple gods. You know, it's, it's amazing that, that that people can't see that. You know, we we've got one God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's it. Amen. Um, the um, now I'm you know I, I when I was a young boy you know I I went to the Roman Catholic Church and you know I guess I was water baptized when I was an infant. I I don't remember it, but I apparently I was. And then I went to catechism, and I learned the basic teachings, and I went through their various steps of, of uh, uh, confession and communion, and, and but I didn't reach the point of confirmation. But I do have a lot of personal experience of this, and I, I, I remember that there was one particular Roman Catholic saint that always stood out in my mind, because over the uh, rearview mirror in my car, I would have this thing, and it, it was a St. Christopher medal, because St. Christopher was supposed to be the one that was going to protect us from accidents and injuries. So, yeah, they, it, they seem to, uh, they have this Roman uh, paganism still in Roman Catholic Catholicism today, where they have these, by the way, let's define what a saint is. In the Bible, this, the word saint is interchangeable with the word believer. Any person who believes in Jesus Christ as their savior is also uh, has the title of saint. But in Roman Catholicism, 
uh, no, not every Roman Catholic, not every believer in the world is, is, is they consider a saint. Only a select few who have, uh, who have done astounding accomplishments in the Roman Catholic Church's opinion, they get labeled as saints. They're like the supermen and superwomen of, of the, the religion. Uh, but uh, they've, they've made people uh, who were practicing Roman Catholics into uh, these saints over certain categories and over cities. Um, so that's still, that's still true today. Uh, some of these things that entered in from the very beginning are still a problem today. Brother, Brother Jason, what, what is your reaction to that? Well, yeah, again, a red flag to go off to anybody when we have to find a mediator other than grace between us and God, this uh, gift of, of favor that we have from God, it should be all that we need. And now, here's the thing, though. <laughs> I often talk about how people are not just going to their saints and this other God that they need specifically for love, this God that they might need specifically for, you know, you might get into this too, Luke. I, I don't even know if they do, but for healing, a God that they might need for financial blessings. And I'm giving a warning to Christians out there. Listen, what are we doing ourselves, though? Okay, we can learn from these cults, like how they make their own little gods for this specific thing, that specific thing. Uh, are we going to something to get our love? Are we going some, somewhere to get our healing? Are we going somewhere to get our prosperity, our wealth, the money that we need? other than just going to the grace of God and trusting Him. Yeah. Uh, well, I, are we doing it? Well, I know the four of us are not are not go going to these Roman Catholic, quote, saints, <laughs> but, but Roman Catholics are, are, are doing that. Uh, they appeal to the saints at, for whatever the particular need is. As I said, the, if you have a need for protection and uh, against an accident, then it's it's uh, Saint Christopher you pray to. If you have another particular type of need, then it's a it's a different saint that you appeal to. Brother Sam, what's your reaction to this idea? I'm sorry, I was uh, uh, reading others' comments. Could you repeat the uh, what uh, the question that we in hand? Yeah, the, just this idea that uh, uh, Roman Catholicism has a saint for a particular need. Like you have St. Christopher if you have a need for protection from an accident. I think St. Francis of Sisi was supposed to be a saint <laughs> to help to have something to do with your pets and animals or something. I, but I, I don't know what, uh, how they label these various saints, but they do give a specific saint uh, kind of authority or domain over a certain uh, need. And that's the saint you go to. So right. what do you want to give that? Yeah, it's like a bunch of, um, you know how the, uh, you know, the, the fallen angels, they have different talents, so to say. They have the different ability, um, just like how, you know, the saints have different ability to take care of your certain prayers and things like that. I mean, that's quite superstitious, isn't it? I mean, we all know that there is only one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's very clear as a daylight, you know, in the scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus, uh, the man, Christ Jesus. So we know there is one mediator, and, and to go through different saints and uh, praying after them and or setting them with some different lab, uh, labels or all those kind of, uh, kind of idiotic man traditions and uh, you know, all the adaptation from pagan religions actually are bondages, you know, putting bondage on them, you know. They still don't, haven't realized the fact that Christ took care of that all, freed them all, and all you need to do is just believe on Jesus Christ. And if you, if you got to pray about something, you pray to Christ, <laughs> not through some saints that, have, that might have, certain value or some kind of ability that, you know, some other people or some Catholic religion has given certain names, you know, it's just ridiculous. 
Yeah, uh, if if that if that idea was true, then I could say. Uh, well, uh, Brother Jason, uh, he's going to be our saint of healing, and Brother Sam, he's going to be our saint for prosperity. Brother Bill, what do you want to be the saint of so we can pray to you for a particular need? you have a particular category you want, Bill? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to be the saint of bamboo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you eat okay. the bamboo, you'll sure to be blessed internally. <laughs> that was great. Very quick on your feet there with that humor. Um, okay, so uh, let me uh, let me go on a little further in this uh, notes here and see what you say. And then now it says the supremacy of the Roman bishop, uh, the, the the papacy, was created with the support of the Roman emperors with the city of Rome being the center of government for the Roman Empire and with the Roman emperors living in Rome the city of Rome rose to prominence in all facets of life Constantine and his successors gave their support to the Bishop of Rome as the supreme ruler of the church of course it is best for the unity of the Roman Empire that the government and state religion be centralized while most other bishops and Christians resisted the idea of the Roman bishop being supreme, the Roman bishop eventually rose to supremacy. Due to the power and influence of the Roman emperors, when the Roman Empire collapsed, the popes took on the title that had previously belonged to the Roman emperors, Pontifex Maximus. Okay, so let's start uh, in, with uh, Brother Bill on this one. Yep, sorry, I always knew it there. Yeah, that's that's right. I've even because even within the the Roman Church early on, and I think they're actually going back to it again after dropping it for a little while. It is is the old edge that you know, there's no salvation outside of Rome. You know, oh, you have to now the Pope and and the Roman religion, along with Mary and all the other stuff, is how how salvation is found. You know, and that that that. That was very, very at the forefront early in the church. It kind of faded out, obviously, you know, after Reformation. But as far as I'm aware, you know, that they, they are gonna, you know, re redo it. If that makes sense. Bring that back into their their catechism. Bring it back into their their doctrine. That that salvation is only found in Rome through either the Pope and the bishops and and their authority. Yeah. Uh... I I would say that uh, that that has been a basic tenet of Romanism pretty much all along, uh, where sometimes it's been official doctrine. Uh, but now, as I said earlier, I find it very strange that this current pope he said some really outlandish things just the last couple of months. As I said, he he says that. Even atheists, I mean, he was asked a question about other religions, if they're going to go to hell or heaven, and he said, he said, no, there's many ways, many ways to get to heaven. Even atheists, if they do enough good works, will go to heaven. So there goes the idea of, of Christianity being the only way, and uh, certainly he's not even claiming that Romanism is the, is the one way. And previously to that, he'd also just come out talking about how the, the creation uh, account in the in the Genesis is like a like a little fairy tale, and that you know God is not a magician. You know God's not able to create the world in that manner. He's not a magician. He, so, yeah, this Pope is really uh, doing some amazing things here uh, as far as uh, some of the statements he's made. Uh, and but Jason, you can respond to that, but also the idea that uh, they centralized everything. Uh, instead of the churches, every church uh, originally um, in the Book of Acts, they were every church was like autonomous. In, it, it, in my home, I have a church, and Bill has a church in his home, and Sam has a church in his home, and 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 each church had, was autonomous. We were not under one person controlling all these churches, but that's what happened with Romanism, and they made Rome the head of everything. Brother Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Browns! We gotta come back, man. Um, I'm watching a Browns game right now, but just think about the 
you know, a football game right now, if somehow a football team were able to – come on, come on, first down. If we're able to just shut off everybody's ability to – cheer for their team the way they desire to in their own homes and in their own ways, what would that be? I'm, I'm sitting here right now and, you know, more than a thousand miles away from where the Cleveland Browns are playing right now. And everything's centralized right there. That's, that's a way for anything. You're going to have law. People trying to control and manipulate and keep everything in one little place. The problem is, folks, though, listen, it's not just with the Catholics, obviously. Look at all the churches out there that are preaching this Calvinism, any kind of works-based salvation. What do they want to do? It's that main leader. And what do they do? They bring everybody back to their one building. Oh, if you want to, you know, do your own ministry, it's got to be done here in this building. So, hey, and you know what? Think about it, though, Luke. It makes sense. They want to have everything centralized right under Rome. And that's not giving people the freedom and liberty to live their own lives because they want to control everything. Yeah, I think it is fair that you uh, bring up Calvinism as we discuss in this because uh, Calvinism is similar to Roman Catholicism in this centralization, this this uh, uh, authoritarian uh, system, where uh, uh, my, I, I, I'm not personally answering to anybody. I, I, I'm not answering to a pastor. I'm not answering to the brethren. Uh, I, I, I have a direct relationship with my Savior Jesus, and um, I, I, I don't need anybody between Jesus and me. Now, but in, in uh, Calvinism and uh, Romanism, you know, they have a hierarchy of uh, a system of government, and they want to put everybody under, under the thumb of this religious system. Sa Sam, what do you have to say about that? Well, you know, the, uh, you know when you said that the, uh, the Pope said even atheists can go to heaven, I mean, the Pope said a lot of strange things, didn't he? I mean, not only that, uh, uh, that he has been demonstrating his humbleness uh, to just kind of show around and to gear, gain the popularity of the Mass, but also, you know, he's kind of um, for evolution as well. And he thinks that our, ancestor, our ancestors were not humans. He thinks that uh, God is not able to create, you know, his creations. He thinks that, you know, God needs some kind of time uh, uh, for, you know, for him to create humans. And uh, we are dealing with that sort of uh, kind of idiotic pope uh, uh, as a representation uh, of, of certain uh, I don't even want to put God in there, a <laughs> deity. Um, the same thing with universalism, and, and I, I like how you put it uh, you know, when you said you know things are getting centralized. Yeah, it is very true. You know, it's, it's another form of it's like new world order doctrine. You know, um, just like how they omitted. Uh, X837, for example, and they omitted so that they can gain uh, money. They can make money out of uh, some baptism, to, you know, giving baptism to babies. So there are many reasons behind this sort of uh, heretical doctrines coming about, and being uh, all this uh, Roman Catholic trying to centralize. Uh, I don't even want to use the term Catholic in, anymore. <laughs> I like the term centralized, by the way. And I think bottom line is that it's, it's the love of money, the, the root of all evil, you know. So when they introduce this sort of crossless doctrines, including universalism or Roman Catholicism or even Calvinism, they are all sorts of forms of NWO doctrines. 
and we gotta be really be awake, you know. We gotta be awake to 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 decipher and discern, uh, especially nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we're the the basic uh, part of our discussion today is is the origin of Roman Catholicism. But the, I'm finding out that as we're discussing this, we discuss each part of the origin of Roman Catholicism, and, and it, it's still existing today. Uh, what they started in the beginning, uh, it's not like it started off wrong and, and now it's corrected itself and it's good. They, they still hold on to these original bad ideas from paganism. Let me move on to the next point, and we'll ask Bill to respond to this first. Um, um, Many more examples could be given. Uh, the last thing I said was that the Pope got this title that was originally reserved for the Roman Emperor called Pontifex Maximus. Then it says many more examples could be given. These four should suffice in demonstrating the origin of, of the Catholic Church. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church denies the pagan origin of its beliefs and practices. The Catholic Church disguises its pagan beliefs under layers of complicated theology and, quote, church tradition, unquote, uh, recognizing that many of its beliefs and practices are utterly foreign to Scripture. The Catholic Church is forced to deny the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. So, Brother Bill, would you respond to that? Well, yeah. yeah. That, what, what strikes me straight away and, and knowing uh, Roman Catholics myself and knowing what they believe is that, that in regard to scripture that they see that their catechisms which is like uh, you know teachings from the church fathers traditions of men and just general traditions within the church over the years they see that as superior to the scriptures and this is where we come into a lot of trouble you know where is the scriptures clear that, that, that brother you know, you know Sam read out in 1 Timothy 2 5, you know, I'll read it again so people really grasp this, where it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. They would then nullify that by going to the catechisms, which would contradict that, you know, where they'd say that, 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 that the Pope is Christ on earth. So the, the, the Pope has got power to absolve sins, the Pope has got power to do all this. So that straight away, the moment they say scripture is lesser than the catechism, you're in big danger, and I think you know that that ties into what you just said. So the, uh, the, the it can be easily proven that the uh, the um, concepts or doctrines and teachings of Roman Catholicism uh, we can trace it back to paganism in Rome, uh, but Ro but Roman Catholic Church's uh, answer to that charge. Is that uh, no? It's not paganism. It's it's uh, this church tradition, and but, but they they cannot find it in the scriptures. So that what they have to do is uh, tell us that scriptures don't have this place of uh, of significance and importance that that the four of us see. And we we see the scriptures as our uh, primary source of truth. We test everything by the scriptures. But they don't. They have to reduce that importance of the scriptures, and uh, instead uh, say that the the truth comes from the Roman Catholic Church and their traditions. Uh, so, brother, brother Jason, still with me? He's probably excited about his football game. Let me ask brother Sam. Yes. So the idea that they they try to defend themselves against the charges of paganism being uh, brought into the church, and by saying that uh, instead, no, it's it's uh, just the traditions of the church, and they have to uh, reduce or, or eliminate the uh, truth that we get from the scriptures. Well, you know. They they try almost everything uh, to erase Christ. And, you know this Pontifex Maximus uh, is just probably means 
pulp, uh, the greatest pulp, and, and, and things like that. I mean, the only uh, the highest priest is Jesus Christ. And whenever they are trying to replace Jesus Christ with whatever name they want to put on, uh, they are just playing the whore. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe my language could be a little... <laughs> but, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, they're not even Jesus Christ, but if they're acting like uh, uh, Jesus, then they are Antichrist. So, for me, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I just want uh, people to just uh, uh, realize the fact that we are all humans, and that only uh, by believing on uh, Jesus Christ uh, we can be saved, not through Pope, not through some Pontifex Maximus, no matter how hierarchic, hierarchically we set up this uh, so-called um, religion, uh, it's not going to work before uh, Christ. You are not going to say, "Hey, I follow this pope." You know, let me in, in, in heaven. It's not going to work that way. You know. Amen. Um, I'll I'll go on reading here about this. Uh, 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 so there, they deny the authority and sufficiency of Scripture is in order to. Uh, defend themselves against these charges of uh, paganism uh, that started in the beginning of their church. So it says, the origin of the Catholic Church is the tragic compromise of Christianity with the pagan religions that surrounded it. Instead of proclaiming the gospel and converting the pagans, the Catholic Church <laughs> Christianized the pagan religions and paganized Christianity. By blurring the differences and erasing the distinctions, yes, the Catholic Church made itself attractive to the people of the Roman Empire. Uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah that's right. That's spot on. I said, I said earlier, you know, it's the, these pagan traditions which were handed down, you know, right from the conception of, of Romanism, you know, are very strongly emphasized. Sometimes they're subtle. You know, and, and hidden to, in a degree, but they're still there, and they're still very much alive within the catacombs. You know, the catechism itself, which they see as on our authority. So it is, yeah, completely you know, from from the time of its conception. You know, being pagan, kind of pseudo Christian, it has developed, modernised, and, and it's really it still has it's got the same roots as you say. Its, it's roots are still heavily. In a paganism. So I think it's spot on. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother, Brother Sam, the, this uh, idea that uh, uh, they they just mixed paganism and and uh, Christianity, and now you no longer have either one. It's uh, it, it, because they put a little Christianity in the paganism, they put paganism in the Christianity, and now what do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. The bottom line, I think, as I said, is that they are trying to erase Christ. Uh, they're trying to uh, put forth a uh, crossless uh, gospel, uh, whether that's um, the Roman Catholic. They always will try to put anything besides Christ. Um, so that sort of things, whenever we see that sort of things, you know, we, we need to really watch out. And that's why we need to uh, the Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, they, they really got to study what they're you know what these Roman Catholic people are teaching, you know, and really check with the Scripture. I mean, why do you think the why do you think God gave us the Scripture? You know, we gotta uh, go to the Scripture whether if this person is saying um, is true or not, um, and we know what the Scripture is good for. You know, it's for for doctrine, for teaching, and for reproving and, and conforming. And, and the problem is nowadays is that a lot of people, including a lot of atheists that come across it, they want to be fed. And also they want to pre presume. And mostly I hear that atheists are saying that you know, God is imaginary. I mean, they believe that God is imaginary, literally. So when they have that sort of problem, when they have that, that sort of issue of themselves, you know, there's nothing you can say about it. 
you know, it's, it's, they're, they're holding to their faith, they're holding to their blind belief that God is imaginary to the point that they think that they can talk about God as if they know God, these atheists. And they are the one saying there is no God. They are the ones saying uh, they lack God. So when they, when we are dealing with these sort of people, and on top of this whole bunch of heresies coming about, you know, these days, my uh, brother Luke, a lot of people are confused. I mean, the lost are getting the, getting more lost. These atheists are becoming more anti uh, anti Christ, anti theistic. Uh, because of why? Because of all the doubts are rampant all the blames and accusations all over the place and they heed they heed uh, this false doctrine, these false teachers because why? because there's you know they want to do certain things but you know they're, if they do certain things they, it's against the gospel so they gotta make up with certain false teaching and come up with heretical teaching and confusing more people so this repeated, uh, some kind of, it's almost like academic almost these days. And, and I, I'm just, I was talking to Brother Bill the other day. And I mean, when Christ comes, I mean, how can he find faith on this earth? It's, it's, I don't know. I, I, compared to seven years ago when I started uh, on YouTube, I, I, it's like, I, I can't say it like hundred times worse, hundred times worse than before. So, you know, it seems like almost nowadays, even ourselves have to keep, you know, living day by day. You know what I'm saying? Oh boy. I was talking, I forgot to get my mic back on. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so really. It's uh, Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. It's it's just a it's a paganism mixed with Christianity. It's just like what Paul says: if you try to mix uh, works with with grace, then in, grace is no more grace. If you mix paganism with Christianity, then it's no more Christianity. Uh, let me move on, and I'll ask Brother Bill to respond to this next point after I read it here. It says. Um, uh, one result was the Catholic Church becoming the supreme religion in the Roman world for centuries. However, another result was the most dominant form of Christianity apostatizing from the true gospel of Jesus Christ and the true proclamation of God's word. Second um, Timothy 4 verse 3 and 4 declares, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Myths. Brother Bill? Yes. Well, I would have even gone further. I would have read the the, the first uh, two and three verses as well because it, it ties in absolutely perfect you know perfectly towards the Roman church is that okay I'll read them few verses yeah yeah please do yeah it says now the spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils okay speaking lies and hypocrisy have their conscience seared with a hot iron alright and this this is amazing here Forbidding to marry. Now we know the Roman Church forbids, you know, its priests and its, its lay people to marry, which causes problems as we see within the Roman Church. You know, they have desires that they shouldn't have, and command them to abstain from meats which God have created to be received with thanksgiving. So, just there, straight away, it really speaks to me expressly that that, the, that this Roman Church is that. What we'd say is that apostate church that it has been it was seduced from its conception, you know, it forbade you know men from marrying, which causes a lot of problems, and, and a lot of other peculiarities. You know, we have transubstantiation, 
you know, which is basically, you know, cannibalism. So these these are all doctrines of demons, and and yeah, the Roman Church fits in absolutely perfect, you know, with Paul's Timothy, you know, you know, in in these scriptures. Brother Sam, you want to respond to the scriptures we've just uh, cited? Yes, uh, and uh, I, for one, witness that every day, <laughs> every day. <laughs> And I'm at the point, uh, you know, at the Revelation 22:11, you know, when Christ said, you know, let them let them alone, <laughs> you know, Christ Christ will come and judge them and um, or, or, or or reward them, uh, if uh, you know, however. So I'm at the point that let those unholy and filthy be unholy and filthy. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, these guys will uh, do anything. They, are, they will not listen to the truth. They will uh, defend their false doctrine with their life. Uh, I don't know why. They, I mean, if it is to do with salvation, I would think that, um, uh, you know, they would listen, if especially to do with Jesus Christ, uh, especially when I'm talking to this uh, this universalist, even Roman Catholic, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this famous uh, PhD Roman Catholic, Fiona Robertson. Even when I was talking to her, and she blocked me after this, but basically uh, I refuted her, uh, the fallacy in her uh, work salvation Catholic doctrine. And despite it all, they would continue with their false doctrine, and despite it all, they would back uh, those people with that heretical teaching. So whenever I witness that sort of behaviors, and I would say, you know what? I, I guess after all, as in Romans 1, you know, even God gave them over. You know, even God gave them over. So what can I do? And I'm at the point that, you know what? Forget about those quote-unquote reprobates. Forget about those who are privily um, came and then uh, forsaken the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Forget about them. Let them be an anathema. You know, I just, I just, I'm done with these people. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, that's that's where I stand for these guys. And yeah, and, you know, it is very true that they will keep themselves these false teachers and false doctrine and for their each years. And that is the, that is the, one of the sure sign of the end times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there, uh, the verse uh, we we're focusing on, 2 Timothy 4.3, and the verses that Bill all added, it's just really talking about uh, uh, these teachers that are teaching things just to tickle men's ears and, and people are turning away from the truth and where do we find the truth? Do we, do we find the truth uh, uh, based upon a, a, a teacher? Well, maybe, maybe not. But Every teacher, whether if we want to determine if they are telling us the truth, we need to go to the scriptures, and that's what's the big problem with Romanism is that uh, they went with popes and tradition of the church and and set aside the scriptures. In fact, they probably burned more Bibles in history than any other group of people. Uh, they didn't want the people to have the scriptures, so. We find the truth in the scriptures, and uh, instead they they turned aside unto to myths, uh, pagan myths that were added to Christianity. Um, okay, now the next part of the discussion will be moving uh, from origins. We know that we've pretty much covered the origins of uh, Roman Catholicism now. Um, now. Some people will argue and say, well, that's not true, but it's easy to prove. And we've, we've 
already in the last session and, and today uh, cited Roman uh, uh, paganism beliefs that were brought into the church and we discussed the history of, of uh, Constantine and what happened when he decided to bring in uh, a Christianity and mix it with paganism. Those things are easy to prove historically even though the Roman Catholic Church will, will deny that. It's, it's historical facts and easy to prove. So now now that we know the origins of Roman Catholicism, uh, I'd like to explore uh, what I would call the, the atrocities of Roman Catholicism. Um, the the uh, We know that starting with Stephen, who was the first martyr in the church, that uh, persecution of the church began. Uh, and then the first Christians who were persecuted were persecuted by Jews. And, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was originally named Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, he was uh, in charge of uh, persecuting the beginning of the church. And then he, he was converted and became our great Apostle Paul. Uh, so, but the beginnings of the church, they were persecuted by Jews who uh, had rejected Jesus and didn't want other Jews to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, but then after that stage of history passed, you got the Roman government through the Roman emperors up until Constantine. Uh, the Roman government was persecuting the Christian church. And that history documents that very, very well, what happened. Uh, but what a lot of people are not aware of is the next stage of persecution, really, that happened in, in Christianity was by Roman Catholicism persecuting the non-Roman Catholics. That's the area of discussion that we're going to move into next. Before I start reading things for you to respond to, I just want to have you like make an opening statement on that, uh, that whole idea. And Brother Bill will ask you to respond first. Yeah, that's true. You know, again, the, the, the Roman pagan church, you know, it's hard to even call it Christian, but for the sake of the Roman Catholic Church, started persecuting true believers straight away. You know, I reckon, you know, historians, and again, we can we can check in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, that, that, that 900 million you know, Christians and others were, were killed by the Roman Church. You know, you know, in them times, you know, and especially in this country, you know, if you had a war on your nose or you had something not quite right with the shape of your face, you was killed, you was executed, you was the devil, you was a witch. And the Roman Church killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people just for slight disfigurements on their body. But like I say, that the majority they did kill were, were true brethren, true, you know, children of God, who just wanted to believe on Christ, you know, in faith alone, you know, without all the money, without all the idolatry and all that, and, and they was the most heavily persecuted. Okay, is, is uh, Brother Jason back with us? Okay. Brother Sam, what's your, your first uh, reaction to my claim that after the Jews persecuted the first believers and then the Roman government persecuted the believers uh, and then uh, Rome, starting with Constantine, accepted Christianity but, but changed it into pagan Christianity. Uh, what was the next stage of persecution? Well, I'm saying that it was from the Roman, the Roman Catholic religion persecuting all of those people who believed in Jesus but would not except the tenets of Roman Catholicism. Uh, are, are, do, you, do you think that statement is a, is a fair statement? Well, well not only that's fair, uh, I think that's a very uh, minor statement. You know, it's not just about killing. Um, we are talking about torture uh, within that killing. Uh, people, many people have been tortured to death. 
Uh, there have been many uh, so-called witch hunting, crusade, uh, killing people, innocent people in the name of God, uh, as if, as if, uh, as if that has anything to do with God. Uh, and I mean, even even till nowadays, these sexual immoralities from this Roman Catholic. I mean, there's so many of this. Uh, Negative things coming about from Roman Catholic. What are some positive things? The only thing that are positive things is that whenever they uh, mention work, whenever they mention about money, but obviously it's it's like big business. Their whole entity is just money sucking machine uh, and, uh, in the name of certain religion. So when I witnessed that sort of uh, killing throughout the history. Uh, a lot of martyrs, uh, and also not only that, trying to um, kill those people who are actually uh, tr trying to protect the Word of God, trying to read the Word of God. They are burning the Bible by thousands, burning, burning people on green wood by thousands for just what? Translating the Bible, for, for reading the Bible. That sort of antichrist activities. Are you serious, people? I, I cannot believe people are still Roman Catholics these days. You know, following that sort of idiotic heresies. So, yeah, we really need to educate ourselves and research because, uh, and also on top, and as I said, we have to be really close to the Word of God, close to the Bible. When we we will notice when we talk about these heresies and heretics. Uh, Roman Catholics, uh, Universalism, all these guys, they are always twisting the scripture. And when you are really facing them with the scripture, they always, always lose and they always chicken out. But they constantly insist on their own interpretation, on a very clear passage, on a very clear salvation passage. And not only that, they would uh, relate totally unrelated passages to salvational issue. Like for example, you know, I'm sorry I'm going into this uh, universalism guy again, but he was keep mentioning about uh, uh, the passage when Christ was talking about how all flesh will see the salvation of God. I think it's uh, Luke 6, uh, something like that, uh, somewhere around there. And I was keep explaining to them and to him, the fact that you know God coming in the flesh two thousand years ago, and that is Jesus Christ, is actually the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. And and Luke six was reciting the actual prophecy from Isaiah, and he he wouldn't just want to accept that. He would just keep on insisting that oh, since all men will see the salvation of God. Uh, therefore, all men will be saved. And first of all, you know, seeing Christ will not get you saved. Believing on Christ will. And secondly, uh, to apply that uh, that a particular dumb prophecy and totally go against the clear gospel that Christ said over and over: only by believing on Jesus Christ can can a man be saved. Otherwise, you you will perish. Otherwise, you'll be gone. You know, you you go you go to hell. And that sort of clear gospel is is getting tainted because of these heresies. And as I say, because of these heresies, people get confused, and and that will lead them where straight down to, to hell. So. This sort of things has to be really dealt with. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm really passionate about this, am I not? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, not everybody will appreciate what you are doing, Sam. But I know Bill and I appreciate it. Other people who, um, who love the gospel, love the truth about the free gift of salvation, and we want to defend it. Uh, we appreciate what you do. You enter the arena. You're willing to kind of wallow through the sewer of YouTube and engaging with these people. It's tiring. It's frustrating.
but you're carrying on the fight and you know what every once in a while someone has ears to hear and you will persuade them uh, so it's a it's an important thing you're doing um, now the I have a question for you about this uh, persecution uh, just just a yes or no question first and uh, have you read this book that I'm going to be discussing here Fox's Book of Martyrs no, I'm not familiar with that. But okay. I have to do it. I have, yeah, Book of Martyr, yeah. Okay, so you've you've heard of it, but you have not read it yet. Well, I you know I I don't I haven't totally read it, you know, but I know of the book, yes. All right, and I know Brother Bill has read it, and and I've read it. I don't have it any longer because I loaned it to someone, and they they never returned it. But um, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, is a historical account of the persecutions of the church and I'm going to be not reading the book but I have some notes here uh, some like excerpts from the book will be going over and uh, it's 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 such a graphic book I probably ought to warn everybody that as we go through it that uh, I think some of it will probably be very graphic if, regarding the types of ways people were killed and, and, and tortured, uh, what the, 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 the believers endured was, was horrible. So why would I ask someone to read such a book? Because it's not pleasant reading. It's, it's very hard to read it, and it, you, can probably, you might even get sick reading it. Uh, but I, I read the book, not because it was entertaining or enjoyable, but because I think I owed it to the people who were persecuted and suffered and out of respect to them, I wanted to read it and understand what they went through, what they were willing to go through because of their faith in Jesus. So we'll be going through this. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, of course, the whole book uh, would be take too much time to cover, but we'll be covering parts of it. And Brother Bill has read the book, and uh, it's easy to find the prove that this is a historical fact that the Roman Catholic Church committed the most horrible atrocities against non-Roman Catholics. Brother Bill, you, you've read the Fox of Book of Martyrs. Uh, what is your kind of like explanation of the book before we get started? Yeah, it's, for me, it's, it's one of those books that is a must read. If you really want to know, you know, what the Roman Church is about, you know, and get some real history on it, you know, you need to read that book, you know. Where I live in England, you know, just in my town and, and the villages surrounding it, there was many, many martyrs that, that, that were tortured and, and hung, drawn and quartered and all manner of wicked things done to them. So it, it's poignant to me because it, it's in the history of my town and it's in the history of my country. So we suffered quite greatly, you know, under the hands of Rome many years ago. Okay, very well. Let me begin then with uh, some excerpts, excerpts on our, from the Fox of Book of Martyrs. It says an account of the Inquisition. The Catholic Court of Inquisitions was first established in 1231 to find and prosecute heres heretics. The first inquisitor was Dominic, who founded the Dominicans. In 1215, courts of, inqu of inquisition were established in several countries, but the Spanish Inquisition became the most powerful and the most dreaded of any. The Pope gave the Dominicans and Franciscans almost unlimited power to find, judge, and sentence to death anyone thought to be a heretic. Uh, let's stop right there first and, and just get your reaction to the fact that the Roman Catholic Church, the popes, uh, established these things called inquisitions. Uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, yes. so that's, that's the truth, you know, and, and they were established straight from, you know, with papal authority to do all, all things, absolutely anything, that we can't branch. There wasn't a thing they, that they couldn't do that could be absolved of, so you know, basically there was given instruction, you can do whatever you want to these people, you know, you can kill them, maim them, torture them, burn them, whatever you like, 
but you must get them to recant and, and come back to the to the Roman Church and give us the money and the gold that we want. You know that that was the the real point. Of it. You know they wanted to, to 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 crush them. They wanted to have supreme authority over every every living creature, and, and this is what they did with the Inquisition. Okay, so S Sam, uh, I mean obviously the the um, idea of the Inquisitions. Uh, is uh, known by much much of the world. People have a basic idea that these inquisitions took place, but uh, I think that very few people know the extent of what the Roman Church did in these inquisitions. Uh, so when we when we disclose what they actually did, does that does that taint the Roman Catholic Church today? Should should someone conclude, well, if this is the history of the church, should this factor in at all to my uh, viewpoint and whether I embrace or reject Roman Catholicism? Do you think that this is a uh, a test that someone should actually consider these atrocities? Oh yes, of course. You know, I mean, Inquisition. When we talk about Inquisition, it's like intense questioning or uh, investigation. And as you know, Brother Bill, I myself here on YouTube uh, do participate in hunting down certain heretical doctrines and and heresies and things like that. But we don't go around, you know, torturing or you know, having this sort of Spanish Inquisition style, that would be quite unbiblical. Uh, if you search the scripture, uh, we are clearly told how to deal with, uh, with these heretics. And you, you just kick them out and treat them like a heathen. You know, there is no such thing as Inquisition. Because, I mean, if you're going to question intentional, uh, uh, intensely, and to the point that you're going to torture some guy because you believe that he is a heretic. When he repents, you know, he's not going to come back and, and believe on Christ. You know, and he's just, it's just going to uh, backfire on the guy. You know, he will hate on the church. Uh, he, he will have nothing to do with, uh, with believing on Christ. So when we do certain things quite unbiblical as this, for example, this Roman Catholic people did with the Spanish Inquisition, torturing, uh, killing, burning, and all that. You know, uh, we clearly can see and we can put certain standard that, you know, that particular woman, that church is not taken uh, as the church is not taken so seriously. So, you know, the fact that they were quite unbiblical about how they treated people uh, when they are actually questioning them, uh, you know, actually proves and actually should point to certain people uh, to have second thoughts about this Roman Catholic religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you've mentioned uh, earlier in the show uh, heresy, and they use the word heresy or heretic uh, numerous times earlier in the show. And so you're you are kind of an inquisitor, uh, <laughs> and I think we all need to be inquisitors to a certain extent. I think the root word of that would probably be inquire. We want right. to inquire about what someone believes, and yet if you inquire and then you conclude that they have a serious false uh, belief uh, that, that rises to the level of, of something that must be addressed instead of just accepted as difference of opinion. It's really very serious. Uh, you said that you, you uh, will uh, separate from them, but you're not going to do the things like uh, disemboweling them or gouging <laughs> out your eyes. Or, you've, you've never done that, have you, Sam? Exactly. I mean, you know, that's that's unbiblical. You know, we have to love our enemies. The thing is, you know, when 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 I talk about heresy, 
uh, it's a little. I consider that a little different than false teaching. You know, false teaching uh, many people can do unintentionally by interpreting certain passages in a different way, or lack of uh, wisdom or uh, knowledge or history. Whereas heresy is like it's to do with your with, with salvation. You know, if it's going to attack the gospel, if it's going to um, if it's to do with um, the salvation matter, um, that's, that would be heresy. For example, this universalism. Um, they are saying that uh, uh, everyone, all, ultimately will be saved, including what's evil. <laughs> you know, I couldn't even fathom that idea. <laughs> so the fact that they're erasing uh, Jesus Christ, the fact that they're preaching uh, this crossless gospel shows uh, that they are interested in your salvation, how to drag you down with them. So heresy is to do with, uh, with uh, directly to do with salvation. Um, but this, even despite it all, I would point out certain things, I would call names, but you know what, that's about it. I wouldn't go around and, and, and torture like how they did, how the Roman Catholics did, or go around and, you know, <laughs> disembowel, as you said. So mm -hmm. certainly, certainly that sort of activities is quite satanic, and whatever, whatever out of that whore is the same thing, satanic. So, yeah, keep yourself away from uh, the satanic uh, uh, Roman Catholic. Yeah, so uh, I would ask Brother Bill to respond to what I just said about the term inquisition being coming from the root word to inquire and the fact that, uh, uh, okay, sh should we inquire about a person's beliefs? And then once we can make a conclusion, what, what are we, how are we supposed to respond? Bill, would you make a statement on that? Maybe he's not there right now. <laughs> Hello, okay. so I was Newton again. <laughs> All right. Like, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Did you hear the question, Bill? Basically, you know, what what is to inquire and what and is inquisition? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, we 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 um we inquire. Uh, and that's what the word inquisition comes from, to inquire. And then once we learn about a person's beliefs and we make a conclusion, whether it's uh, you know heretical or not, you know what is our response to that? Or how do you see all that? Yeah, yeah. Well, there are, like I said, there are correct, you know, biblical parameters. You know, Titus three ten and, and two Timothy four two explain what they are. You know, should, should I read them out? Yeah, it says, so Titus 3.10, it says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So we're clearly told if someone is, you know, preaching a false gospel or they've got some real dodgy teachings, you know, we warn them in love twice and then after that we kind of wash our, you know, wash our hands of it. And then obviously in, in 2 Timothy 4.2, it says, and this is to believers, you know, to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, and again, that is to be done in love. So the, the correct way as as a, as a Christian to, to be an inquisitor or to inquire is in love, and it is to give people a couple of chances to you know see their error out ways. That's as far as it goes. You know, then it's up to God to deal with things after that. Now that verse you quoted there did did you leave off the part where it says that uh, uh, to burn them at the stake? Yeah, I must have. Yeah, yeah I, I think I actually missed out to flagellate them as well with broken glass. <laughs> yeah. So uh, obviously, uh, if we follow the scripture, we're not going to be doing these atrocities, and therefore that just shows that the Roman Catholic religion uh, they weren't following scripture. The scripture does not tell us to treat people that way uh, when we conclude that they are, are heretic. Um, Okay, let me, 
Let me go on and I'll read a little bit more from this uh, excerpt from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, uh, the power of the Inquisition was strengthened in 1244 when Emperor Frederick II published an edict that all heretics should be burned at the stake. Uh, when a heretic was condemned, he was whipped, tortured, sent to work on a galley ship, or killed. Galileo was one of the most eminent men of science and philosophy did not escape the eye of this cruel despotism. This famous scientist was condemned in the Inquisition for his belief that the earth moves around the sun and is not the center of the universe. He, to save his life, admitted he was wrong and swore, for the future I will never more say or assert either by word or writing anything that shall give occasion for a like suspicion." Unquote. Immediately after saying this, he reportedly whispered to a friend, quote, the earth moves for all, all that. So, um, yeah, it's um, the idea that uh, people are going to be forced to recant. Now, I know that in Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's examples of people who would not recant. But uh, then there's there's also some examples of people who did recant to to save their life or to save themselves from uh, pain and suffering and torture. But uh, even them, they, uh, uh, they they didn't really change their belief, did they? They simply recanted and stated publicly, like Galileo did, that okay, I was wrong. But he didn't really believe that. So. What's really accomplished when you force someone to uh, publicly say that they don't don't believe that anymore, Sam? Well, you know, let it be an atma. Uh, so, the uh, if someone publicly don't believe, then I guess then that's his choice. Uh, but the problem is, is by what standard are they saying they're publicly not believing? Uh, and also, and also, I, I kind of come across with a lot of uh, a lot of these um, people kind of confused between non-believers and unbelievers. And although some people may say that there is no difference, but for me, I I would like to set a certain difference between those two words. Uh, non-believers, I would consider them as those who have not been gospel yet those who do not know the gospel yet. Uh, unbelievers, I would, uh, I would say, those who, uh, who clearly understand and know the gospel, yet reject the gospel. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think, what we call uh, the reprobates. Now, we can find that word as well in the Bible, and talking about people who have uh, openly rejected the gospel, who have rejected God, uh, to the point that they, 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 they would say they don't want to be in heaven. I mean, I'm going back to this universalism again, and these guys are still, these guys are saying that despite it all, you will be still saved. You will be still be in heaven. And I'll be saying, you know, and, and, and they, will, they will be saying, you know, otherwise God would be not powerful enough. The God wouldn't be omnipotent enough for our aim to save everyone. And I, I, I told them that because God is powerful, and besides being powerful, because God is all loving, God is not going to uh, make, a, make his choice, make his decision to forcefully or to force someone to be with him eternally. You know? So, if a person say he doesn't believe, then he obviously is not a believer, and therefore he won't be able to be saved. So um, I I can't understand why some these some of these universalists uh, want to insist on everyone being saved. But you know what? As Christ said clearly. Uh, 
you got to believe you got to believe on the son of god you got to believe on jesus christ to to be saved and otherwise uh, god will not uh, accept anyone uh, that reject god you know he's, he's not going to make you into a robot to forcefully uh, to uh, worship him so i think that's that sort of uh, error that they they preach uh, kind of shows their own unbelief they say they believe but because they don't really understand the gospel they are actually practicing unbelief so when they say they're believing on Jesus Christ or even someone say I don't believe on Christ you know what let it be if that's between you and God if you are if you think that you are uh, before God, you are humble and you are honest, you are frank, you are totally na naked before God, and you know, do so. But do not preach on different gospel. You know, saying that you don't need the blood of Christ uh, to to boldly enter into the kingdom of God. You know. If everyone is going to be saved, what's the point of Jesus Christ? What's the point of cross? If everyone's going to be ultimately saved, then where is the power? Where is the omnipotence in God? You know, they do not seem to consider what sort of that sort of false doctrine, that sort of heretical teaching can lead someone to hell. And as the as the scripture clearly say, if you do so, it's better for you not to be born at all. It's better for your neck to hang about and just go down. You know, you offend those little ones. Little one meaning not just little kids, but also people with little faith. You know, so brother, look. When, whenever I, I I come across with certain people and they they proclaim that you know whether they believe Christ or not, or they say they used to be Christian, or they say that everyone will be saved. Whenever I come across with it. You know what? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, uh, if you cannot even do that, don't you know? Speak your own heresy. Don't judge others. Don't accuse others as if that you are some sort of authority or God. And you know, that's one of the things that I notice a lot among these heretical people. You know, they judge you a lot. They accuse you a lot. You know, according to their own heretical doctrine and according to own interpretation. I know I've gone off tangent a little bit again, but uh, I'm sorry I had to lay it out a little bit. <laughs> okay, thank you, brother. I uh, I want to. I'm curious with uh, brother Bill's uh, opinion on this example of Galileo that we cited, and there's many others like Galileo that uh, I know that when I read Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, I was amazed at how much torture some of these people endured uh, and then a, just a slow painful death and they would not renounce their faith and then there were some people that because of torture or the threat of torture they they recanted and they renounced their faith and then there were another group of people where they would renounce their faith but then get a guilty conscience and then come back publicly and proclaim their faith again knowing that they were going to end up being tortured uh, suffer a slow death, but these these people here um, uh, take those three types of people, Bill, and discuss them a little bit. I'm particularly interested in the ones that that uh, do recant. Uh, what you think of them? How would you how would you explain them? Well, for starters, because they was under under duress and they was being tortured and, and stuff, you know. It varies upon each individual's faith. You know, God gives us each a measure of faith. You know, talking about the believers, and obviously people who who, who awaken the faith, still saved, but awaken the faith. You know, would would recant quite quickly. You know, but because it's under duress, you know, in God's eyes, they're still a child of His. You know, and and as we was talking about it, that brought to mind uh, two Timothy two thirteen. And that says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. 
So this is, you know, if this is talking about weak Christians, saved Christians, that, that go through troubles and torments and things like that, and for a while they, they don't believe, they, they, they recant, they, they get rid of the faith. But, but God knows the heart. And then the, the, the other example you brought up was people who refuse to recant. You know, these are people who are really strong in the word, who are really strong in the faith, and, and they was prepared to be martyred, you know, for, for what they believed in. And then obviously you get the middle ground where some people recant, then felt, you know, the conscience was, was heavy on them, and then reclaimed the faith again. So it really is an individual thing, I believe. You know, and it's the degrees of people's faith. You know, I hope and pray that if this occurs again, which it may, you never know, that that that, that God would give me that measure of faith or I wouldn't recant. But either way, you know, I'm a son of God and I'm saved through him and not of myself. So you know, let let God judge that situation. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I agree totally because that's what I was getting at. Even Peter denied Christ like three times, not because uh, you know he was denying Christ as as being the Son of God, but but he was just scared. He was just being a chicken. Um, so you know, I can understand where uh, people denying Christ out of certain pressure or political reasons and things like that. I, I don't I don't blame them. All right, and that's my personal. Opinion, um, I, nor do I believe that they would lose salvation just because you know out of fear they would say they don't believe or can't. Um, so I think that is a little uh, you know based on individual, as Brother Bill said, uh, and also uh, you know as long as you don't you don't deny Christ as being the Son of God. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> you know, God, as, as he said, God knows our hearts. You know. Um, well, I'm glad you brought up Peter. I think I think Peter falls into one of those three categories: the the person who recanted and then felt bad about it, and then later in life, indeed, did suffer a slow, uh, a horrible death uh, because of his faith. Yeah. Um, uh, but now we we all believe uh, in eternal security. In fact, I, I think that really is what the gospel is: is is eternal security. If it, how can we even be a Christian if we we don't believe in eternal security? Because it means that we're saved. It's settled. It's irreversible. And so we we who believe in this, uh, we we would have to conclude that even the person that recants. Uh, they're still saved. They may feel shame afterwards. But here's an interesting thing. Bill, I want you to uh, uh, quote that verse again in a minute while I'm thinking. But don't let me forget. Quote that verse and talk about that verse you quoted. But I've, uh, you know, with this age of terrorism, and, and uh, I've heard a lot of things talking about uh, in, in the United States. A few years ago, we used to talk a lot about uh, is it okay to torture the enemy to get information? And uh, people, they always concluded that every person has a breaking point. Uh, and knowing that, I mean, a person can hold out for a long time, but eventually every person breaks, according to what I was hearing these experts say. So if that's the case, then if they break, but does that that doesn't change their true belief? It just changed change. It just explains the fact that every person does have a breaking a breaking point. Uh, so, Bill, could you quote that verse uh, you cited there about Christ's faith? He remains faithful, and and explain that to us. Yep, yep. That's two Timothy chapter two and verse thirteen, and it says, "If we believe not, just talking to to, to save people there. All right. So we believe not." Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. And the beauty of that is that it's clearly saying that, that, that our salvation is, is all based upon Christ, you know, and his promise. So if someone, you know, through uh, weakness or temptation or, or, or torture or persecution, for a while believes not, you know, they're still saved because Christ cannot deny himself. He cannot deny the promise he has made. So that's a, that's a comforting verse, you know. Not, I'm not saying that we should all feel free just to stop believing, but what it is saying, you know, in our in our 
moments of weakness, because God knows the heart and judges the heart, that, that if, 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 if a true son of God gets to the point, as you said, where they break, they can't cope anymore, or, or under duress or whatever, they, they kind of say, oh, I'll, I'll give up, I don't believe in God no more. You know, they're still saved according to his promise. And, and as eggs is eggs, and day is day, you know, come before the moment they die or pass on to the next life, you know, they, 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 will, they will confess Christ, I believe, even if it's just in their heart. You know, they won't, you know, entirely deny him. That's how I read that, that passage. Yeah, the, uh, uh, that, that breaks it down even a step further. Uh, uh, I was talking about a person who would, uh, rec they would say what they had to say because of the pain and suffering. And they didn't really stop believing, but they say they don't believe it anymore. That's, but, but in that verse you've quoted, it takes it a step further and says, even if a person actually does stop believing, Christ still remains faithful. So I, I'm just really, really happy to know that my Savior is faithful no matter what happens to us, uh, whether we had, to, we had to recant because we broke, or even a person who actually did lose their faith, that the Christ remains faithful. Uh, Sam, comment on that and then we'll move on, okay? Uh, all right. Sam, did you hear me? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I didn't know if there was, there was a technical oh, problem yeah, or something, was... but, but you want to make a final comment on what we've been discussing, uh, and, then, and then I'll move on. Right. I was just saying that I don't have much to comment. He's, he's just that um, he's, he's just, he just remained uh, faithful. You know, we may let go of his hands sometimes, but, you know, he's holding our hands still. You know. Yeah, aren't we all thankful for that? Okay, let me go on reading this about uh, excerpt from uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, so we have Galileo that you know he recanted and immediately whispered to a friend that he didn't really recant. You know, uh, some thirty-two thousand non-Catholics were killed in the Spanish Inquisition. Of the Inquisition. Fox notes, quote, tyranny is of three kinds, that which enslaves the person, that which seizes the property, and that which prescribes the dictates of the mind. The first two are civil tyranny. The third sort may be called ecclesiastical tyranny. This is the worst kind because it includes the other two. The Romish clergy not only torture the body and seize the property, they take the lives, torment the minds, and tyrannize over the souls of their unhappy victims. Brother Bill? Yeah, that, that really sums it up. That's poignant. That, that gets to the heart of, of, of the Roman, as I see, cult. It, it's satanic. You know, it's evil. You know, we know that God is love. The word even declares, you know, you know, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And and torturing people, whether it's, you know, vexating their spirit or, or giving them bodily blows or financial issues and tormenting them, that is certainly not from Christ. That is not Christ of the Bible, and that is not the Christ that, that us true sons of God, you know, believe in and proclaim. Yeah. So Sam, it, it, it's it, it stated there that uh, uh, the inquisitors they would not only seize the property of the person, they would seize their body and torture and kill the body, but they would also uh, seize their mind and and and, and take try to take control of their mind, not, not allow them to be a free thinking person and think and believe what they wanted to believe. Sam. Yeah, you know, I mean, what can I say? As Brother Bill said, it's uh, quite sadistic, um, and uh, I don't know if if it is uh, if it could, could fit the definition of masochistic, <laughs> but uh, I think sadistic would be a more uh, correct definition. 
it seems like they feel pleasure out of um, you know other people's torture uh, torturing them and uh, I, I don't know how one could do such a thing and especially when they uh, proclaim themselves they are you know Christians but in a way I'm glad they are you know they have another name for it called Roman Catholic so how can anything be justified? You know, how, I don't know. I mean, somewhere I think I don't. Somewhere in the Revelation, I mean, you know, they are crying out, "How long, my Lord? How long?" You know, this all this atrocity, all this um, torture and killing. How long is it going to be? You know, Maranatha. That's all I can say. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maranatha. Amen. All right, um, so now I'm moving on to, it says, in the 13th, uh, no, this says, the persecution of Protestant leaders. In the 1300s, John, uh, is it pronounced Wycliffe or Wycliffe? Uh, I've, I've heard it pronounced both ways. John Wycliffe, Wycliffe attacked the Catholic Church and the Pope, whom he called the Antichrist and worked to translate the Bible into English. He was brought to trial and condemned as a heretic for his attacks against the papal authority. Wycliffe finally went into hiding and died a natural death in 1384. Forty-one years after his death, however, the Catholics removed his body from his grave, burned it, and threw the ashes into a river to destroy any memory of his work. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brother Sam, uh, they, they if they can't if they can't get him while he's alive, they'll get his body and destroy it. I mean that's Yeah, we have heard that sort of horror stories before, haven't we? I mean, you know, starting from this, you know, slow burning green wood um, to um, that sort of Behavior, you know, you you got to kill that person twice or three times, you know, it's it's total hatred, for what, for what? <laughs> I just don't understand. Uh. Okay, uh, brother Bill, uh, well, maybe you know how to pronounce uh, Wycliffe's name better than me, but uh, the fact that if since they couldn't torture him and kill him while he was alive because he went into hiding. Uh, they, they dug up his bones and destroyed that, those. I mean, uh, to look at what lengths they were, will, they were willing to go to get at someone who disagreed with them. Yeah, yeah, it's pronounced, well, we pronounce it Wycliffe. Yeah, that's where we are. That, that's, that, that's actually vary from where you live in England. And, and the, the reason they exhumed his bones was, was actually sicker than you can actually imagine because the, the Roman Church of that period believed that, you know, come the, the, the translation or the rapture, when people are taken up, you know, they have to have some type of body or bones left. So the Romans got his bones, burnt them, ground them up and threw them in the river so that you disintegrate in their eyes any chance of, of him going to heaven in the rapture. That is, that is why they've done that. It's like, it's like pure evil, you know. Just in case that we did something wrong, and just in case he might get raptured, we're going to grind him up <laughs> and spread it apart. I mean, that's like so oxymoronically moronic. It doesn't even make sense. You know, just in case you are saved, we're going to grind your bones up. <laughs> because yeah. also, they misinterpret where it says in, is it, uh, in the Old Testament, you know, that, that God will, will put uh, the, the sinews and, and the bones and, and, and the flesh on the table. You know, that they use that to say that, you know, the only way you're going to get to heaven is, is if you literally do have some part of your body left. <laughs> so they translate it. So they think, well, burn it, grind it, they're not going to heaven. It's that stupid. <laughs> it is. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, this is, this is not uh, 
on topic as uh, as we've said sometimes it's okay to go off the topic if the subject is uh, interesting or important and uh, I, there probably are some viewers that um, wonder about these things and the, and the rapture the, the resurrection uh, uh, is, is it must a person be buried uh, so they have some remains what about cremation is that okay how about the people who are lost at sea or or destroyed in a fire you know uh, how can they be resurrected uh, I've got an idea on that but I'll, let me ask you guys to comment on that brother Sam well you know how can anything be be impossible with God I mean you are saved you are saved for God's sake so no matter what kind of form you are in you know I mean do you think, don't you think God will do something about it you know, it is that unimportant. So I don't think people should worry about, you know, that sort of thing. Although that I think proper barrier uh, uh, would and should be recommended than, uh, you know, uh, crimination. Uh, you're you're saying that uh, you uh, you support a burial right over cremation, but it doesn't affect them being resurrected. Right, right. Okay, brother Bill, how, what what do you say to the person that's concerned about their remains and the re, uh, and the resurrection? Well, I, I'd actually quote what the actual word of God says because it clearly says in one Corinthians fifteen fifty, you know, it says, "Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God; neither doth corruption inherit incorruption." You know, our bodies. Uh, these bodies that we're on earth are temporal bodies and they're not going to heaven anyway <laughs> so you know that 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 one verse blows out of the water you know what what you know the the, the Romans believe to, to you know bodily you know resurrection and stuff you know that, that our flesh and bones are not going to go to heaven we're going to have a new body anyway so yeah that's 1 Corinthians 15:50. but you know anyone who wants to, to look that up Right, right, exactly. I mean, uh, flesh and blood will not enter, but in our new body, in uh, flesh and bone, uh, certainly. So, I mean, when we are given with a new body, I don't think um, I don't think any old body, whether uh, in whether that's sort of in dusty form or, or new, <laughs> a day old newly body form, I don't think that's really matter. Well, yeah, you, you gave some interesting uh, ideas on this. Uh, I, I've got, like, I guess three answers to the person that's wondering, well, what if I get cremated instead of buried? Or what if I I die in a fire? Or what if, uh, you know, what if there's no uh, remains to be for the resurrection? Um, well, Sam basically gave the, the short answer and that you know God's omnipotent you can do anything and you know, whether whether you have remains or not if there's anything left of your body or not he can do it he's God so how does he do it I have two theories uh, one is that um, you know we, we talked today about the idea of cloning you know being a possibility and we with scientists I guess are actually cloning some kind of animals and I think that there are some governments have even passed laws against it because it looks like it's maybe scientifically possible to do it but uh, you know all you need is the like the DNA and I guess and well God you know he has our DNA if my body didn't exist at all if there was not one little, uh, one uh, piece of my body remaining then uh, he still has my DNA file and he can just from that DNA just recreate a brand new body for me. Another possibility I think is that he could, he's not limited to time, uh, uh, a linear time as, as we think of it, where you have a past, present, and a future. You know, being outside of time, uh, he could just very well, just before our bodies are destroyed, go back in time to when we had a, a body that was not destroyed and use that body, pull it from that point in time to provide a body to get resurrected and glorified. So those are just a couple of things that I thought of as uh, possible solutions. But, you know, God is God and he can do it. However he, however he does it, uh, he will do it. Uh, any final things on that before we move on?
Well, for me, I think uh, the uh, glorified body cannot be done or made on this earth. Uh, and also, as far as, as DNA is concerned, I think it's basically information, and I, I think we can be recreated uh, even with the same information. Uh, but, but, you know, um, our, uh, you know, new glorified uh, body, so to say, uh, I don't think that will be bound, only bound on this earth, but I think it's, it will be a uh, perfect body, you know, a heavenly body. Um, I don't know how uh, how God will <laughs> do it, but I know for sure it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, Brother Bill, any final comment on that before we move on? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Sam. You know, you know, God can do whatever He wants, you know, as He wants, you know, and, and, and He doesn't have to worry about, you know, gathering up bits of dust from, from ashes of burnt bodies. You know, it, it, it's our spirit which is eternal. So when, you know, when we get translated that glorious day, you know, we'll put on the incorruptible. We'll have a perfect body which will not see corruption ever. And our spirit will just fit in like a glove, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, so um, uh, there was a, a distinction between the two of you about flesh and blood versus flesh and bones, and I know a lot of people uh, make uh, place a lot of importance in that distinction, but I don't think we need to go into a great talk on that. Uh, but I, w I would just say that um, to the viewers, uh, let, let's say that Sam receives a, 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 a burial and I uh, end up cremated, then uh, I, I'm sure that God's going to be able to uh, give us both resurrected glorified bodies. Uh, okay, um, we're getting close to the end of our time, so uh, there's also obviously a lot more to be said about Fox's Book of Martyrs and these uh, persecutions from the Roman Catholic religion. But let's take the final few minutes here to kind of sum things up and then do an invitation for people to receive the, the gift of salvation. Um, let me ask Sam first to, to just thinking of the entire discussion today. Uh, anything that you want, you think that you'd like to re-emphasize, uh, and then I'll ask Bill to do the same. Well, you know, I... I it's a little unrelated, but at the same time, it is related. I would like to just, you know, I, I don't want anything to re-emphasize other than, you know, we already talked about. Uh, but I do like to mention that uh, there are some people who actually, uh, you know, kind of like, so to say, dissing <laughs> or uh, downright disrespect uh, the uh, English translated uh, version of the Bible, King James uh, Bible, for example. A lot of people uh, went through a lot of trouble. A lot of people died because of, you know, because they want to uh, preserve the Bible. Uh, and I see, and even this person that I was talking to, this universalist I was talking to, and he was discounting uh, the, the Bible, so to say how translation is incorrect, and so on, how we should stick with the original scripture, when we all know there is no such thing as, quote-unquote, the original scripture. So basically he's saying that, you know, we have to know Greek, and we got to uh, study Greek, and we have to go by the Greek Bible, and so on, and that we cannot trust the translation of English Bible, and so on. And I thought that was the most ridiculous, ridiculous statement I ever heard. Uh, there have been many people, uh, people like in, in Russia, uh, they have been converted because of the Bible, because of the translated Bible, you know. Especially, uh, I especially like King James Version, and, and many people don't have any clue what sort of qualification they have to be to, trans to be translating the Bible. 
what sort of people were involved, what sort of ex expertise and studies researchers have gone through, what sort of uh, martyrs, what sort of people have been shedding their blood to, you know, keep the Bible, you know, to be to translate it. And as you know, Brother Luke, in all the Roman Catholic, they had forbidden people to read, read from reading the Bible or even from translating the Bible. And here he is, a heretic like him, telling me that this sort of translation is no work. This sort of translation should be discounted. Are you kidding me? You know? And this is exactly what I wanted to say. Because of that sort of poor, heretical mental mentality, these guys are disaccounting all these blood, not only the blood of Jesus Christ, they are disaccounting all this blood of martyrs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. I think the, uh, the bringing up the Bible translations is a very valid point for our discussion. It's uh, uh, as we go through this uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It, it, as we continue on, we're going to see that people uh, were persecuted by the Roman Church because they didn't believe in uh, sprinkling; they believed in immersion, uh, or they were they were uh, persecuted because they they didn't believe in transubstantiation. They they didn't believe that the bread wafer actually became the actual literal flesh and, and, and blood of Jesus uh, or in this case uh, as Sam mentioned and in our example we cited earlier John Wycliffe uh, because he dared to translate the Bible into into English uh, they wanted to kill him so these are there's a lot of reasons that the Roman Church wanted to kill people uh, and uh, so we'll go into more detail on that as we go along. Bill, in any uh, final remarks here uh, regarding what we've discussed today before we go into the invitation? Yeah, yeah. I'll just like really very, very shortly to to summarize to, to anyone watching that, that that Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. You know, there's a lot of confusion out there. You know, and a lot of people, you know, come to me who are atheist or just agnostic, and and they bring up the fact that all these atrocities that that was done in the name of Christ, but it's not the same Christ. So if anyone's watching, please don't assume that that, that a child of God is of the same ilk as a Roman Catholic. We're not Roman Catholics. You know, we submit to Christ only. No Pope. No doctrines of men and no doctrines of demons. And as true Christians, you know, we, we, we would never envisage want to torture people or to be like inquisitors, you know, beyond biblical scope. So that's the first thing, you know, we are not Roman Catholic, we are Christians. And the second thing is, which is most important for anyone's watching, whether they're, they're, not, they're, they're in the Roman church and they haven't put their trust in Christ yet, or whether they're atheist or, or agnostic, is just know the day that, that Jesus Christ loves you so much that he died for all your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again victorious according to the scriptures. And know also, if you was the only person alive on earth today, he would do the very same for you. That is how much the real Christ of the Bible loves you this day. Call upon this Christ, be ever loved and be ever saved. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, you know, in, in these discussions, um, we we now we're the subject is Roman Catholicism. We've just <laughs> uh, over the over the years, uh, we've discussed an awful lot of interesting topics uh, in these these uh, hangouts. Uh, but uh, at the end of the discussion, we do not want to be negligent and make sure that you know what is most important and Bill just touched on that right then and that is that okay uh, we're saying that Roman Catholicism is not Christianity well then if that's the case what is Christianity what do I have to do so that I am a Christian uh, brother Bill, Bill talked about it brother Sam do you want to expound on that at all 
Oh, yes. I mean, you know, that's simply uh, what Brother Bill said. Uh, I, I would like to say, believe in Christ and live, otherwise perish. Uh, there are people uh, out there uh, saying that uh, through certain work you, uh, you can be saved. Or even there are some people out there, you don't have to do anything. You don't even have to believe on Jesus to be saved. All these things, not true. Uh, believe and leave, otherwise perish. That is good and bad news and the gospel, in short. God bless you all. Thank you. Okay. Amen. Um, all right, let me let me just review some of the things that both of you just mentioned. Uh, Brother Bill talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Brother Sam, Brother Sam said, "Believe on the Lord Jesus and live," and uh, that that's all true. That's that's the point. Exactly the what the point is that we want you to understand and believe. And the reason each of these things are important is because this death on the cross that Jesus endured, uh, he did that to pay for our sins because there was a barrier between man and God. Man did not have access to God because sin held us back. It was a barrier. So uh, God loved us so much that he decided he would come down to the earth and become a man named Jesus. Jesus said that he did it so that he could give his life as a ransom so he became a man so he could die to make this ransom payment to pay for our sins. So this death on the cross is critically important. You understand that he paid for our sins. You don't have to pay for your sins. Uh, if you're trying to pay for your sins through repentance and works and changing your life, uh, and not only will you fail, but it's unnecessary because Jesus already paid for our sins. Now, uh, he, he was buried. You know, that, that is further proof that he was actually dead. And he raised himself from the dead. Uh, that proves that he is God. Only, only God has the power over life and death. It proves that he was successful. So, uh, and it proves that we are justified in putting our faith in him. Why should I believe in Jesus? Why should I trust him? Well, because he, he proved he's worthy of my faith by raising himself from the dead. Now, as Brother Sam said, once we understand this death, burial, and resurrection, what do we need to do? We need to believe on him. That means we don't believe on ourselves any longer. Most people in the world, if you ask them, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? They're going to answer the question uh, by saying that they believe in themselves. I'm a good person. I go to church. I do this. They're trying to be justified based upon based upon their own personal performance. But we're asking you, what you to do today is no longer believe in yourself. Instead, believe on Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Jesus, remove it from yourself. And if you believe in Jesus completely, then that's when he gives you this gift of eternal life. Now, that's what we're asking you to do right now. And if you do it, please make a comment on the video today so that we know about it. We'd love to make us very happy. So, uh, well, that's that's it uh, for this show. We've taken two hours, and uh, uh, we'll continue talking privately here for a while to visit. But uh, I hope you'll join us next week. There's much more to be said about the atrocities of the Roman Church. We'll continue on with that topic next week. So uh, uh, if you believe on Jesus Christ, and I... I, I Pray that you will be blessed, and I certainly pray that you will learn to rest in this love and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.